Um, so we kind of got this all thrown together. Um, we weren't quite sure where we were going to get a spot, and we weren't quite sure what kind of connectivity we were have. But they do have like these, uh, like these connectivity stations with power and USB, and they're yeah. like these tables, and they've built these boxes on top with boxes, plugs, plug four plugs yeah. on each side. On and side. so we kind of just came over and commandeered one. We did, and uh, took it over, and now that's where we're broadcasting. I from. actually, I actually predicted that. Uh, mm-hmm. As we're walking in, I said, mm-hmm. you know, and he goes, how, how are we going to make sure we get that spot? And I said, well, if we just start setting down microphones and mixers and like, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> everyone will just kind of move. And sure enough, they moved. It was great. This is Linux Unplugged, episode 106 for August 18th, 2015. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's live from LinuxCon 2015 in Seattle, Washington. My name is Chris. And my name is Noah. Hey, Noah, are you ready for an exciting show today? Jeez, am I ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's only taken us two hours to get here, three hours it's to It's exciting here. for us because we uh, we're live on the floor, and that's always, uh, especially when you get here and you don't know where you're going to be live from, it's a bit, it's a bit challenging. But uh, not, only, not only are we here, but we took the uh, con experience up to the next level because we're also here with our Mumble Room. Time-appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Pip, pip. Hello. 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 Hello, guys. I'm glad our, our, our virtual lug could be here. They know the, the Seattle Greater Linux Users uh, Group is uh, is upstairs. We should yeah. talk to them at some point. They have yeah, that'd be uh, really cool. Their lug is here, and uh, I, you know, it, it kind of got me thinking. Like, uh, we could do like uh, af- we could do like we could bring the mumble room with us to like after show parties and oh, just like yeah. bring them on a phone. Oh yeah, would that be any fun? Really cool. Oh, that would be yeah. heck of fun. Yeah, maybe if we do that. Yeah, I got the mumble client installed on my phone. Yeah. Well, coming up on today's episode of Linux Unplugged, we have a couple of things from the floor we're going to play. Uh, uh, Bruce Schneier, renowned security expert, uh, gave a keynote talk this morning, and uh, he had some interesting points he wanted to make. You. Me. You managed to finally get somebody from HP to go on record and I talk did. about some of the behind-the-scenes stuff that they have not shared publicly that they're doing on I, Linux. I did. I've been sitting on that information for over a year, and it was driving me nuts. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. Because they would not say, they, well, like they, wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they would not confirm it publicly. It's like this big, it's like this big thing, yeah. uh, this big, huge thing inside of HP that everyone's using Linux, and they... And they, they, they wouldn't talk about it on camera. Yeah. And I, I you know I, I harassed the heck out of them last year, and I didn't get anywhere. And then this year, they found that a person found a guy who found a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy <coughs> that was able to talk on camera about it. <laughs> and so we got it. <laughs> uh, so at uh, LinuxCon uh, Seattle is uh, is uh, about three floors of goodness. Um, there's uh, you know your basic floor, then you got your second floor where. To be honest with you guys, we thought was the main floor when we first got here, and we'll get to that in just a second. And then there's a third floor where people that have sponsored and some other showcases are up there, uh, and it's right here on uh, in Seattle on Sixth, and I think it's Pike. It's uh, at the Sheraton Hotel, and it's a really, really, really nice location because if you get a little burned out and you want to go get some fresh air, you can just go for a walk. And uh, there's tons of nice places here in Seattle to go to, and so we've taken advantage of that. And we'll probably tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, later on in the in the show today, but uh, I wanted to tell them tell them about our first impressions when we walked into LinuxCon. So I, it's a little embarrassing, uh, but I'm willing well, to admit it. Kind of, but I mean, I don't think that was really our fault. I think that's more of a layout issue. Yeah, you yeah. think so? Yeah. So uh, so we we got in, and uh, the first thing you find is the registration desk, and that's where you get your badge and your shirt and your swag bag yeah. and yeah. stuff like. So we go we go over there and had a nice lovely conversation with the lady who, by the way, told me to walk through a wall. And uh, and she sends us upstairs because you you register at one booth and then they send you up to another floor yeah. which there's another registration booth where you hand a ticket from the first registration booth to get the rest of the stuff that you thought you were going to get at the, the the one that you went to, right. to begin with right so after we got through the two registration booths one to register and one to get the stuff that I should have got the first one then we walk out like right out out of that second registration area and we see what appears to be the show hall and uh, there are like nine booths. And Chris looks at me and goes, well, is this all there is? And I remember last year, the expo hall was actually so small that they actually put it inside of the keynote room. And it was just, there was the keynotes and then at the back wall, along that back wall, were the the booths. That was it. You missed a key part of our trip, too. Because our first stop stop was actually the media room. That's where our first, we didn't actually go to the expo floor first. We went to the media room. Oh, that's right, to drop stuff off. (laughs) And we we bumped into a friend of ours. And he said, did you guys see how small the floor is? And I said, what? And he's like, did you see how small the floor is? It's unbelievable. And that is why when we got there, we thought, oh, this must be it. This must be the floor. Yeah. And, and the other thing that was sort of fascinating about it is when we got there, we realized every single one of these booths was basically 
a deviation on itself. Like they were yeah. all the same product, just different makers. Like it was all container management software. It was, right. all, and we were like, oh wow, this is it. And so then, like I was a little bummed. I'm like, I'm not sure who we're gonna talk to. ContainerCon 2015, man. Yeah, uh, and it really, you know what? And that that first impression does kind of stick. It mm-hmm. really is ContainerCon 2015. Yeah. Could Docker, and we're gonna talk about that more in a moment. But can, this is ContainerCon. But however, it turns out when you go up to the third floor, you get your more traditional, you know, vendors. Like here, we've got Cloud Foundry and Cisco and Citrix and Canonical and Docker and DigitalOcean is here, GitHub's here, and Google is here. Uh, of course, the Linux Fest Northwest guys are here, and SUSE is here, and uh, Stack Exchange is here, and Samsung, and SanDisk, and uh, a couple other uh, well-known folks you probably know of. Uh, Amazon Web Services is here, Atlassian is here, and uh, a couple that we're going to play some interviews for you are from here, too. So once we got up to the third floor, it was actually, it seems like a pretty happening event, and the, and the sessions are, are really intense. A lot of sessions... T- this time, all about containers. Not all containers, but a lot of sessions about running a software in container, managing applications in containers, putting your desktop applications in containers. Like it's mm-hmm. all about the different specs, the app spec, and the different initiatives. And th- that's maybe been, that's why they've codenamed it ContainerCon. Yeah, 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 it's definitely the theme here. So yeah, um, I got a couple of clips I want to play, a couple of interviews I want to okay. get into. Uh, and we had a few people in the chat room that asked us to kind of compare the difference between LinuxCon and Linux Fest. So I want to do that in a little bit as well. And, uh, yeah, and kind of give you our general impressions. So before we get to uh, the uh, first interview, I do have a bit of an outtake I could play. Do you want me to play our first outtake? Sure, yeah, let's this do is, that. Uh, this is Chris and Noah entering the uh, LinuxCon. And I was going to record, a, 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 you know, build this beautiful theater of the mind for you guys. So we'd really be able to illustrate what it's like to get here, but... Uh, well, Noah was very, very enthusiastic about creating that theater <laughs> of the mind, and um, he might have gone a little overboard with uh, painting the picture. Entering Linux Fest. Okay, no, here we go, Noah. LinuxCon 2015. All right, let's walk through the door. Inside. Nice. Oh, that's good. Head to the uh, head to the escort. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll step on here. Okay. Shut up. You're so bad. <laughs> I'm trying to give them a story. Uh, too what's obvious. happening? You're too what's, obvious. what's happening right now? You don't obvious. know. You don't know. You just you just paint, you just paint the scene with the sound. Paint the scene. There's no the sound. <laughs> So we, uh, we, we got here, and uh, we do have a couple of interviews to play. We went to, the first thing we got to work was we knew we had to get some stuff for Linux Unplugged because we had a live broadcast, and that was our first drop-dead thing. Uh, so before we get into that, I'm going to tell you about DigitalOcean, the first sponsor on today's uh, Linux Unplugged. DigitalOcean is super, super handy. We're bouncing clips around and things like that, and it's very, very easy to spin up droplets. And we, you, when you combine it with something like Docker, and man, is Docker huge here at LinuxCon. And, of course, DigitalOcean's here as well. You really have something special. Use our promo code DO Unplugged to get a ten dollar credit. And here's the best part: DigitalOcean has five dollar a month plans. So for five dollars a month and less than fifty five seconds, you can spin up a droplet with five hundred twelve megabytes of RAM, a twenty gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And they've got data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and a brand new one in Germany with lots of great connectivity and good regional locations. And DigitalOcean's interface is so slick and straightforward. The zero resistance to get up and get something up and running or deploy an application. You want to do Ubuntu LTS with Apache or something like that. It's clicks away. There's so many great ways to deploy software using their interface, but even better, they have a straightforward API you can take advantage of and snap it into your existing management infrastructure or just use some of the great apps. They have so many good community tutorials that have been written by the community with professional editing done to them. They pay people to edit them. It is a really good experience, and it's great for testing and production. We use it for all of the above, and it is our go-to Linux deployment platform in the cloud. And if you use Docker, if you use CoreOS, if you're using FreeBSD, if you're using CentOS, Ubuntu, Debian, in. You name it, you can deploy it on DigitalOcean in seconds. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code DOUNPLUGGED. You can use that at any time, and that'll apply a $10 credit to your account, and you can also support the Unplugged podcast. DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code DOUNPLUGGED, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. All right, uh, Mr. Colonel Linux over there. What do you say uh, we jump into uh, a couple of our interviews that we got here, and then we'll kind of chat about it a little Man, bit. Man, would I like to do that. And uh, I wanted to start with uh, the uh, Core Infrastructure uh, Project's announcement this morning. They had a keynote this morning, and uh, they, had, they covered a lot of things. But one of the uh, initiatives that keeps getting better and better is in the wake of Heartbleed and Shellshock, we saw the Linux Foundation, along with a bunch of other stakeholders in the industry, come together and uh, launch the Core Infrastructure Initiative. 
And the core infrastructure initi- initiative project has been giving out money. They just announced they're going to be paying for the main developer of NTP. Father Time is what people call him. And uh, he's, been do- he's been working on NTP, just making nothing but uh, pennies. And now they just announced they're going to support him, which is great. Hopefully they'll help with some of these NTP reflection attacks. All the different projects they're investing in have been extremely important. But there's been one thing that we really haven't been able to kind of agree upon industry-wide, and I think we could all agree that if we don't come up with a common set of agreements and standards, governments will. And so the Core Initiative Project is setting out to create a open-source best practices program that's going to be hosted up on GitHub, and this clip tells us a little bit about it. Today what we're doing is announcing essentially an open-source project Uh, which will be rolled out later this year, but we wanted to get community feedback on a best practice program that essentially allows open source projects to meet a set of criteria, whether it's having a security mailing list, peer checking of code, doing static analysis on your code, doing threat modeling on your code, to essentially indicate that you care about security and that it's important to your project. People who receive that badge will be able to display it on their project site or in GitHub uh, and indicate that they have met that criteria. What we really want is all of your feedback, uh, and we don't want it in the form of a bunch of comments. We would love it in the form of GitHub pull requests. So uh, we are doing this. Uh, uh, this goes live today. We're actually announcing this later on this afternoon at a media-exclusive uh, luncheon on the Core Infrastructure Initiative, so you all getting a sneak preview of this today. Now, I think this is a fascinating idea. So it's sort of a voluntary program submission, and you get a certified, you meet the best practices. And uh, I've been talking about this on and off with Alan on TechSnap, but how do we, how do we solve this problem where, you, as, a, as a business, you want to use open source in your mm-hmm. enterprise, but you don't know if it meets a certain, I don't know if quality standards is the right you word, don't want, you, you, want it, you want it to meet a, you, you want it to meet a standard, whatever standard that is. Uh, and actually, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because we do that in basically every other field. It, yeah, aviation, like, uh, anyone can make something, but they rate it to be used in aviation. Or like, uh, for example, Oracle, right? Yeah. They go out and get their so- their software better business bureau certified for certain amounts of software to, to be to be free of certain amount of flaws, which is kind of a total joke. But there are like there are industry certifications now, and this is one that I think what's cool about this is it's going to be open up to the general public. And I don't know if anybody mm-hmm. in the mumble room has any thoughts on a, on a program like this or maybe any potential downsides, but since it seems volunteer-based to me, uh, it seems like a pretty good approach to this, and I like that it's being run by the Core Infrastructure Initiative because they seem to have their priorities in, uh, yeah, pretty well aligned. Uh, anybody in the mumble room have any thoughts on this? Going once? Twice? No takers. I, uh, okay. All right, well, then we'll move on. I thought it was a good move. I think I really like what the Core Infrastructure Initiative is doing in the wake of Shellshock. And things like that. I'm I'm very very happy about that. All right, Mr. Noah. Then I'm ready for uh, my next clip here. And uh, this one was kind of interesting. It was from Bruce Schneier, and he was talking about attributions of cyber attacks and why attribution is so hard. And kind of using the Sony attack in in sort of the lens to look through this problem. And if you recall, Sony was using Linux and Apache web servers and things like that. So it's, it's kind of relevant to us because a lot of times Linux is in the server infrastructure. So if there's a problem there, uh, it very much falls on the Linux system administrator to, to, to manage that. So Bruce Schneier, uh, was, uh, he, was, uh, he was connected in via Google Hangouts this morning for the keynote. There's a little bit of audio glitchiness because his computer had bad audio. But the content is super uh, critical and important, especially with what's going on these days in cybersecurity. So here's Bruce Schneier talking about how attribution is difficult. The other big issue, and I think the biggest issue that Sony brought out, is that attribution is difficult. I mean, compare two attacks. In 2006, Israel attacked a Syrian nuclear power plant. They did it with planes, planes and bombs. And... The recipient of the attack, Syria, could could look up in the sky, see the planes, see the flags painted on their tails, and know where the attack came from. 2010, U.S. and Israel attacked an Iranian nuclear power plant. Uh, We did it with a cyber weapon, with uh, Stuxnet. The difference is that there was no way for Iran to attribute the attack. Actually, Iran didn't seem to have known it was an attack until either the press outed it or possibly Israel or U.S. called Iran on some diplomatic channel and told them. And it's very difficult to attribute attacks on the Internet. We know this is true. Right? Packets don't come with their turn addresses. And it's easy to false flag. 
it's easy to uh, pretend your attack comes from somewhere else. My belief is that a lot of attacks from the Western countries go through China simply because everyone knows a lot of attacks go through China. And that's a perfect way to, to, to hide where you're from. I actually uh, was really glad he, he made that point uh, that, you know, it's very possible that attacks from Western countries are just being routed through China because a lot of times the narrative is oh, just a Chinese attack. Now, no, one of the things that jumped out at me about that talk, uh-huh. and he's talking, he's talking about security, is one of the n- main things that the vendors here are showcasing is how to patch your applications in containers. Like, people are, like, everybody has a different solution for that. Right. How to manage container security, yep. how to update applications in containers, how to know when the applications in the containers have gone behind, how to know when the application quits working. Yep. All of that is, um, like... I would say, and maybe do you, do you agree that like it seems to be like the number one product that's being talked about here, the number oh, one yeah, problem? Well, I th- so I think so. The container technologies themselves, we have, uh, you know, we've built communities, and, and and there's already that the the standards exist for that, right? And so, what's left, where the market is, where there's left to to, to make a business or money is in products managing those things. Mm. Because like we're talking about, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the drive is you're not going to. Uh, nobody is going to manage that stuff from the command line, right? Even if it, even if it's possible, so you you need some sort of a solution, especially if you're doing it at a yeah, scale. Yeah, and the other thing is is uh, uh, containers kind of encourage you to have a lot of them mm-hmm. because not only is your density higher versus virtualization. So on right. a server that could have ten virtual machines, maybe you can now have twenty containers because you don't have the emulation overhead. But you also are kind of encouraged to do a container per application. So you put your mail server in a container and your web server in a container and your uh, you know your your group collaboration thing in it. You know, all these different things go in containers, all of a sudden you have you have a dozen containers for one small office. And so one of the things that they're finding and talking about here is that container proliferation is just exploding. Yeah. And then even small shops have like all of these containers they have to manage. Right. And then the other thing they want to do is move them between services depending on which more cost effective. Yeah. So Schneier talking about attribution and tracking all of this and security patches and updates is kind of relevant, so that is a problem they're trying to solve here. Uh-huh. Uh, but I actually really, really liked his point um, about why we are seeing so much attribution to China and Russia these days. Because sure. whenever you hear about a cyber attack, it's Iran, China, yeah. North Korea, or Russia. Every yeah. single time. It's never yeah. anybody else. It's never Canada. <laughs> it's never Mexico. Yeah. Sometimes it's the Syrian Electronic Army, but not so often. It's usually one of those guys, and he tells us why. And um, it's genius. Like, what I love about Schneier is, like, for the first five, five, ten minutes of his talk, I was like, oh, this is no good. Why is this at LinuxCon? Yeah. Why is he saying this stuff? And then the second half of his talk was all, like, he took what he set up and kind of re-looked at it in another lens. And, and he just, he's connected a few dots for me that I've not quite, like, why are we just so publicly slamming these, these ma- massively powerful nations and, 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 and saying, you're hacking us with the OPM breach or whatever it might be. Yeah. It's, you know, it's China. It's... Why are we doing this? Well, he kind of explains why, um, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. And then after that, we have the HP interview, which they also were here talking about the machine, so that was interesting too. Right. But um, before we get to that, I'll tell you about Linux Academy, okay? Because we were uh, we were chatting with some folks in the hallway about different educational resources, and I think Linux Academy has something unique that the other guys don't have. And I tell you, it comes up all the time, especially with containers. Is this technology is a moving target? You know, app spec is relatively new. Not much of the courseware out there really reflects that fact. Uh, in fact, pretty much almost none of them do. The difference with Linux Academy is those enthusiasts there at Linux Academy are following this stuff because they want to, right? They're following this stuff because that's what they're passionate about. And then they got together with educators and developers, and they created the Linux Academy education platform. You go there, you figure out what you want to learn, they tell you how long it's going to take. You choose from seven plus Linux distributions. They automatically spin up the virtual machines to match the distribution you choose from and the courseware adjusts. They've just added new courses as well because they're adding new content constantly. And they have team accounts as well, so if a few people want to go in and learn something, you can. That's a good way to motivate each other. They have an active community stacked full of Jupyter Broadcasting members. And I encourage you to go there and look at the different programs. Get started by going to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. That'll give you our 33% discount. And then when you're there, log in. Look how long it's going to take you to learn Python or Ruby or Apache or you know what backing up your machine using TAR. Whatever, the, whatever kind of gap you have in your knowledge set that you kind of want to fill in. Linux Academy has courses on it. They also have these nuggets. You can find them, and you go there, like, you know, two minutes to 60 minutes long. They just deep dive right into exactly a course that you want to learn about, which is really kind of nice because I've been able to use their time availability planner when I'm kind of, like, getting on more of a routine. And then when it comes time to, like, just really focus in on work and I don't really have time to get in something deep, 
I can still do a nugget from time to time. You know, my certification is coming up at the end of this year for um, for Red Hat. Yeah. And so I was I was originally I, my my last certification was in RHEL six, and now I'll be doing RHEL seven. And I have gotten the practical things nailed down so that I can start rolling out because we want to be using the you know RHEL is. I don't want to say behind, but as stable as it is. Uh, so when when you go to when, if you're not using the latest stable version, you know it's it's really stable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so and and so I have I have nailed out the, the you know the practical things, but what I haven't quite got down is all the nuances that they're going to ask me in the test, mm-hmm. right? And I don't have time, as mm-hmm. you might imagine, to take mm-hmm. off a week to go mm-hmm. do all of my recertification stuff. But I need to learn all the stuff that they're going to ask me. found out Linux Academy actually has a course on that. So, uh, And I use them to learn the, the practical things. Yeah. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually retake the course. Yeah. This time I'm going to go all the way through and learn all of the differences between RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. Nice. That's only possible because I can do that from my laptop yeah. while I'm here in Seattle. Because yeah. we, you know, everything always takes longer than they think it's going to. You know? yeah. So yeah. Uh, that'll be great. That's nice. Linux Academy Academy.com slash unplugged to go get the Linux Unplugged discount and support this show and uh, just take your skill set up a notch. Linux Academy. Thanks, Linux Academy, for sponsoring the Unplugged program. You guys rock. Okay, let's play this, play this Schneier clip here. Uh, this Schneier clip is our last one from Bruce, although I might go through his talk and see if there's any more we want to pull out, but I want to grab these ones because I thought these were short enough but extremely poignant and uh, just for anybody involved in interest in technology, uh, very relevant. So here's Bruce Schneier on why we're seeing so much attribution these days, basically why we're seeing the uh, blame game from different nations. And there's an arms race here, which I think is important to think about. This arms race between attributing attacks and hiding the origins of attacks. Uh, attribution versus deception. And the U.S. is in a singularly powerful position here. Like the NSA surveils much of the Internet okay, for a bunch of reasons, right? They have a bigger budget than everyone else, actually, than everyone else combined. And the way the Internet is routed, a lot of traffic goes through the United States. A uh, big article uh, la- on the 15th uh, last week on how AT&T is doing quite a lot of eavesdropping for the NSA both within the United States and in their network uh, network points all around the world. Uh, 2012, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, Leon Panetta, he said publicly, he's talking publicly about attribution, and I'm going to read a quote of his, of his, that the U.S. has made significant advances in identifying the origins of cyber attacks. That's an interesting statement, and we actually don't know what that means. We don't know if uh, if the NSA has some fundamental technological advance in identifying packets. Probably not. Uh, Or that their espionage is so good that they're monitoring the planning process. I mean, we don't know what sort of secret evidence the NSA had. I mean, did they have um, uh, recorded phone calls from North Korea discussing the plan? Right. In my in my fantasies, I think they have the document of uh, King John Un's signature and on the approval to go through with this. You know, we actually don't know what. But it's interesting that uh, attribution leads to deterrence. In the past couple of years, the United States has been more forthcoming in identifying who attacked them. They've, in several cases, identified North Korea. Last year, uh, we indicted five North Korean government officials in absentia for, for hacking. We've attributed uh, Russia. Now, oddly, in the OPM attack, there was one statement by Clapper where he said it was China, and then everyone kind of backed off, and there's no official attribution. But by and large, we're seeing more attribution. I think that's because it's in the U.S.'s best interests to signal that they can attribute. To say to the world that if you try this, we will know it's you. And there is deterrence here. And actually, I think that leads to over-attribution in some cases. But the thing about attribution in cyberspace is that providing evidence is tricky. Initially, the United States fingered North Korea, but provided very minimal evidence. And there's broad mistrust in the security community. So there was a lot of people, myself included, who just didn't believe them. And if you think about it, there are several types of attribution. There's the lowest, where where I know you did it. There's a little harder, I know you did it and can prove to you I know you did it. And then the hardest of all, I know you did it and can prove to the world I know you did it. 
The United States succeeded at, at one, possibly we succeeded at two, but we failed at, at number three. Right? Attribution based on secret evidence is entrusted. You know, we all remember uh, Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. And this problem only becomes worse as more of our attribution relies on secret evidence. Right? We're, we're going to announce who attacked, we're going to expect the world to support us in retaliatory action, and yet we won't be able to prove who did it. And, and this is going to be complicated. Mm, complicated indeed. So, uh, sorry about the little crack leave the audio there, but that was just his feed coming into the uh, con today. It wasn't anything we could do about that in the recording, but I thought it was uh, really interesting. He says, essentially, you know, one of the reasons we're doing attribution is because it kind of defers people from doing further attacks because they know we'll call them out. Yeah. This guy, uh, it's kind of interesting. Maybe that is why we call out China or call he's from the internet. Why is that? Uh, it's just that that's the recourse that you have on the internet, right? It's calling yeah. people out on things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trolling, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so Schneier went on for a little bit longer and uh, talked more about the problem. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see if there's any more clips you want to pull out of that. No, I, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the differences between uh, LinuxCon and a Linux Fest. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, trying to keep in mind, there's two different audiences for Very each. Much Do so. you want to describe what you think? So, um, I tell you what, uh, you know, maybe you want to take the, you know, maybe you can take one and I'll take the other. So I'll, I'll, I'll come at it from the ultra speed perspective. Um, so I have attended Linux cons for many, many years. I'm probably going on, well, since 2009, whenever, so, you know, I've been there numerous times. And only in the past year, uh, I have come from the eyes of, um, the, com- uh, the community member that's interested in the projects. Prior to that, I've always come to LinuxCon with the idea of I need to come back with ways, with solutions for my customers and Mm. ways that I can make money. Because at the end of the day, while talking about the community and open source and software, that's all great. Somehow, I have to find ways to buy McDonald's and, and, and buy hotels to come out here and do stuff. I can't do that if, if I can't sell solutions. And so LinuxCon and OSCON really, uh, are both conferences that are really geared towards doing that. And I, and I know that that kind of rubbed you the wrong way in some circumstances in mm. that, you know, the, this idea that everyone is selling something. Um, and there is a difference there. Uh, and uh, and as a community member, as somebody who's just interested in seeing Linux and playing with Linux, it's really not that exciting. Um, but for somebody who can take a solution back and say, you are selling a solution that's maybe ten or $15,000, but I could put that into, I have four or five clients that we could implement that in, mm-hmm. and well, then we could net a $50,000 profit mm-hmm. to me. That's, what that's do you think about this? Is, what do you think about this as a high-level differentiator between the two? A Linux Fest is where you go to meet the people who are creating the code. Linux Con is where you go to meet the people who are selling the code. Yeah. Well, or, or OSCON. Well, uh, so there... The only objection I have to that is there is a lot of development or d- development focused uh, sessions. If sessions. You look at, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the sessions, a lot of the people that are speaking mm-hmm. here at LinuxCon mm-hmm. are speaking as a developer and two other developers. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a bit of a mix. You, yeah. know, you can also kind of tell one another. Another way to tell is you can kind of tell by the attendance price. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. So it, these are you know, the, yeah. the ones that are a little more expensive, or generally they, they they kind of probably are figuring maybe your department or your right. business is sending you picking it up. Yeah. I, I I guess I would change uh, developer focus to um, uh, you're meeting the the people in the community versus you're meeting the people selling the products. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I might twist it a little bit that way, and that's not to say that this isn't a good conference or it isn't a it isn't a pertinent conference or valuable conference. I, oh, I think I, for I, some people that's extremely valuable. Ex- One absolutely. of the conversations I've noticed a lot happening here is folks that don't quite understand everything that's involved in sort of switching their infrastructure over and so they're coming here and I overheard a couple of conversations uh, um, I forget the name but it's one of the Docker container managements just right here on it starts like with a ranch or something like that right here on the corner sure and uh, a couple of different gals were talking about how uh, you know they're coming from uh, some Microsoft mom management system and they're moving over to different systems and they don't really quite understand this oh she's <laughs> or the one gal there is why this story even sticks yeah. out is because she called it the I don't quite understand this whole open source trend and I just kind of thought oh how cute it's not a trend <laughs> anymore, sorry. No, yeah. <laughs> so we we don't have call- taken over the yeah. world, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you deploying a Windows machine would almost be a trend. At this yeah. You know, uh, so, yeah, I, I thought that was particularly funny, is there are a lot of people here who are not necessarily totally plugged into the community aspect, 
right. that they're more plugged into the utility aspect of it. And, and, and in their defense, there's nothing wrong with spending your money to come to a conference to learn how to make more money using a technology that, let's be frank, is actually very profitable. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and good, secure, and, scalable. Right. Um, it's just that it is a very different lens than you or I might take uh, to get there. And I, I think that's why we're having a little bit of a, a, little bit of a challenge keeping, uh, keeping our, uh, our get-go up. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose so. I think, uh, yeah. I, well, I, I'm looking forward to in uh, the Linux Action Show, kind of, uh, kind of putting it all together. The whole yeah. like we want to really kind of try to capture the experience coming. I don't know how successful we'll yeah. be, but yeah, we're going to try to give you more of the this. What you're getting right now is really, you know, we've, we've been here for one day. This is our this is our mid game impression right now. Right. We're only we're only midway through the game. We still have the shirt contest tonight. We still yep. have the uh, booth crawl tonight. We still have the meetup. So yeah, the meetup I think is where is 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 where is where the rubber is going to meet the road because that is I think if there is anyone that's coming from the meetup that's been at LinuxCon, great. If they're not, even just even just fine, yeah. yeah. Um, but that is where we're going to hit that. Well, that's where we're going to hit the community part of mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where you and I kind of both have our passion. We both kind of mm-hmm. shine is in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but but nonetheless, I, what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to accomplish is, we are trying to be that network that is that goes, to, you know, to these conferences. We we bring all this equipment here, we set up and we stream and give people that don't have the opportunity to be mm-hmm. here uh, mm-hmm. an idea of what's here and you know pick what? out the you know pick and pick the, the best parts. I just realized something too that would be kind of fun maybe if you're not normally at these events, mm-hmm. especially LinuxCon, more so than almost. The other ones I've been to because LinuxCon is a Linux Foundation event. Yeah. So this is kind of like the official Linux event, right? Right. And so that brings out all of the open source journalists for the most yeah, part. Yeah, Like a lot true. of yeah. them are here mm-hmm. and a lot of people in the industry in the different, you know, like Mark Shuttleworth is here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the CoreOS guys are here. The Docker guys are mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. SUSE guys are here. Tons and tons of Red Hat people are here. And what's kind of neat is you get to meet people that have built things that okay. you're familiar with packages that you've installed tools that have solved a problem for you mm-hmm. and these people are here and they're in some ways for some of us nerds they're kind of celebrities in a sense yeah very much so you know um and uh, you know hey that's that name i've seen in a blog post yeah. a thousand times or their picture next to their post and and now like right as literally as uh, we were going on air mm-hmm. we had a journalist stop by and take a selfie with me because yeah. he and i have never actually seen each other in person we've right. only seen each other on online it's like hey yeah. good to see you yep. and so it's kind of neat like when you're coming from the outside you get to kind of see the people behind the scenes that work on a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. at, at LinuxCon. Like, mm-hmm. even eventually, the rumor is Linus will be here at some point. He doesn't go to the other ones. Yeah. Uh, because this is this is LinuxCon. Well, this is really ContainerCon, yeah. but this is LinuxCon. Might, might be a little more than a rumor. Might actually be on the schedule. <laughs> I just don't, you know, until we have tape of it, I don't want to commit to it. Yeah. But it, I guess, we're going to attempt to get tape of, uh, yeah. of Linus Torvalds. And yes, I said tape. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, yeah, uh, Dorth Ranger says, I'm curious how it compares to Linux cons from the first dot com bubble. Back then it was all venture capital. Now it's real profits driving attendance. That's a really interesting observation, yeah. North Ranger. Um, it's smaller in scale. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they have been on the decline. Although, I guess, uh, it, to me, this looks smaller than it was last year. I guess the attendance is up, though, from last year, which is a good yeah. sign. Yeah. Um, well, that is actually the interesting thing is both last year, OSCON, oh, I'm sorry, um, Ohio, mm-hmm. and LinuxCon have scaled down. But their attendance has gone up, yeah. and the vendor participation has gone up. Yeah. So the interest from the public and the vendors yeah. is going up, but the con organizers mm-hmm. are scaling down because I think cons in general, in general with a few yeah. exceptions, are scaling. Yeah, down. Yeah, I think so, and I think part of that is that you you are able that as people become more self reliant and become more educated them, uh, themselves, I think that they're able to find that the information that they w- that a lot of people would have gotten at a conference, um, and then as the internet kind of exploded and and things like blogs and wikis and forums have taken off. The uh, sorry to interrupt you. The uh, head of the Fedora project just walked by and gave us a wave. Yeah, <laughs> so that's nice. Uh, I think that uh, I think that as that happens, people are able to get that information. They go, I don't need to spend that money to come to come yeah. out to the conference. And, yeah. and I got to tell you, you know, speaking from speaking from my own wallet, uh, I have always made money coming to LinuxCon, yeah. coming to LinuxCon and taking those solutions home and reselling yeah. them. Yeah. I have always come out ahead. You know, and the key point of that, and I've liked it a lot, is Tech Dog in the chat room says, "I used to, uh, I'm used to the kind of CES show." Where most of what That's interests me similar, turns yeah. out to be vaporware, yeah. but here, 
everything here is a shipping product that they're demoing. Like there might be a couple oh, yeah. things that are about to ship, but I but ninety eight percent of everything here, if you get an if you get an introduction to it, uh-huh. if you get hands on information and you get a name and a number, yep. when you go home, you can call that person and they can ship it to you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but as far as the as far as the feel of the conference, yeah. very similar yeah. to CS. Yeah. Have you ever been yeah. to CS? It's a yeah. very similar yeah. feeling conference. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that's true. I guess they I guess they don't show uh, they don't show uh, not released stuff yet for them. And there's a couple of that actually. Yeah, now that there's a couple of it, things but. here and there, uh, and that's actually though. But you don't really mind that. You like you like seeing the code before it's finalized. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that was announced here that uh, is pretty neat. In fact, before we go, I want to get a picture in front of it. Mm-hmm. Is uh, IBM's uh, mainframe one? Oh yeah. Making a big stink about that here at LinuxCon. And that uh, are we allowed to say that that's going to be uh, yeah you can that's going to be coming out on last. So we yeah. have an yeah. interview with them, yeah. and we have we have as probably the coolest video I think we've ever yeah. shot. Yeah, and that's going to be we'll have in, that the, in the Linux Action Show this weekend, which right now we tentatively are planning to do Friday at three p.m. But yeah. that might change. JupiterBroadcasting dot com slash calendar. Uh, so yeah, the the uh, and the canonical guys uh, here announced. Yes. Uh, um, I don't know. If, I don't know if you know anything about that. Not to put you on the spot. I don't really know anything about it. But if you do. You're more than welcome to chime in, but Canonical announced that you'll be able to get uh, Ubuntu. They are, yeah, they are shipping. They they have just released uh, Ubuntu for yeah. the, the, this IBM Z series. And of course, frame. the SUSE guys are doing it too, and you know, but uh, it's really neat. And yeah, Shuttleworth, yeah, it's, uh, Shuttleworth it's did a surprise. A at Go ahead, Pope. Giant, pretty black box with orange stripes down the side. Yeah, yeah. That's all I know from yeah. the photos I've seen. Yeah, and, and Mark was there up on stage. He came up and surprised everybody, and uh, during the announcement, and uh, so that was pretty neat. But we're not here to talk about HP. We're going to talk IBM. We're going to talk about IBM and Linux Action Show. Why don't we talk about HP? Let's do you it. want to do this? Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, this next clip, uh, Noah tells me, is uh, is super cool. Is it's, this, it's, is, it's one I've really wanted to get to for a long time. So last year, I, I think I can tell this story now because I, they've come out on camera and, and, and addressed it. But uh, last year I was here and I was talking to a couple of the HP guys. And I said, you know, I wish there were more big names that like actively supported Linux like inside, like on the desktop. Not just on servers, but actually you know, running it. And he goes, uh, and the guy tells me, he goes, I run Linux on my laptop, my work laptop. That's this is an HP employee? This, yeah. This is last year. And he goes, I run it on my laptop. And he looks over. And goes she, her over there. She runs Linux. We don't. We've never even installed Windows. Our work laptops come this way. I said, "Well, how does the company treat you? Oh, they treat us great. They, all the software supported. They support it. And and he goes, and uh, yeah, it just it just works out of the box. Everything works. And and there's a there's a big majority of, of us that are doing that. And I said, "Wow, that's really cool. Would you talk to me about on a, on camera? And he goes, "No, I don't want to do that. Yeah. So this year I came here and I walk up and same story. I start yeah. running into the HP employees <laughs> and they're like, "Oh yeah, we all use Linux. I'm like, "Why won't anyone talk to me? And they're like, "Well." We know a guy who knows a guy, and he's friends with this other guy who knows this guy who was trained to, to speak on camera. He would be able to talk to you. And I'm like, does he work for HP? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, does he use Linux on the desktop? Oh, yeah. I'm like, find him. Got so him. they go over all of the conference yeah. hall. They're looking all over. Yeah. And this guy comes over, and he goes, can I help you? And I'm like, do you run Linux on your desktop? And he goes, yes, I do. And I'm like, I have a camera. Stand right there. Yes, you can help me. All right, so we're going to play this interview. You know what? Before we play it. Why don't I tell you about our last sponsor in the show today? Uh, that'll be Ting. And I want you to check them out because right now this whole show is running off of Ting, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, the, we, we actually started on the event Wi-Fi, which is pretty solid during the setup, and we thought we'd be okay with that because they, they're pretty they're, – they're like, they're like a dog with a bone when it comes to finding rogue wireless signals around here. So we started on the event wireless, and that was walking for a little bit. But uh, i got to tell you, you go to linux.ting.com because at the end of the day, it, we were so glad to have backup connectivity. Linux.ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Look, look Look at the signal strength. Look at that. Full, full signal. Full bars. Yeah. Full bars of LTE That's inside, nice. in, inside of here. And you can look around mm-hmm. people dropping uh, oh, on yeah. and off. Well, we were... Now, the only thing we did a little clever is we positioned ourselves next to a gorgeous view. Yeah, that's true. So we have yeah. beautiful windows nearby. But So that's helping, but that's just us being savvy. And so if go to go to linux.ting.com. They'll take $25 off your first Ting device or $25 off your Ting account, uh, or, you know, credit-wise. So you get $25 of service credit. And then you're just like, for, for me, in my first month, that, that paid for it. It's... it's wireless service with no contract and you only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 for the line and it's just your usage on top of that and that's what you pay. They have CDMA and GSM. Are we, we're on CDMA right now, right? Actually, we're on GSM. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're, so we're on, we're on the GSM Ting network right now, rocking that and you can too and you only pay for what you use and what's great is when you, just need, to, when you need to use a lot of data, maybe one or two months out of the year you pay a little more. The rest of the year, your bill's so low that it more than evens out. It's gorgeous. Linux.ting.com. Go there and try out their savings calculator. Plug in your actual usage. See how much you would save. I'm saving more than $2,000 in two years. I can buy a laptop. That's nuts. Of course, I need a laptop more often than that. Actually, my Bonobo is more than three years old. 
And, so still, and still going strong. Yeah, so there you go. All right, so that's not so bad. Linux.ting.com. Try out the dashboard. Check out their blog. It's great service. We're using them here at LinuxCon. We're broadcasting to our Mumba Room and to our IceCast server using Ting, the live LinuxCon coverage powered by Ting. It's great to have data in your pocket if you're in IT, and they have great phones. Everything from super, super, super value phones for like under 60 bucks, you know, like feature phones, up to like the greatest hot rods like the S6, the Nexus 6, Moto X2, all that good stuff. Linux.ting.com. Okay, Noah, I'm going to play this interview you got from HP. I'm really looking forward to this because I haven't heard this yet. I've been waiting. So here we go. Here's Noah and HP. We're here with HP and with Keith, and I noticed that in the back here, he has this big sign that says HP Breathes Open Source. And as a fellow breather of open source, I thought it might be interesting to stop and talk with Keith. So tell me, Keith, uh, anyone at HP use Linux? Uh, a few people, yeah. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm actually the architect for Linux on the machine. Uh, the machine's a new hardware project we're working on, and the operating system we're developing to, to, that we're porting to that, op, to that uh, hardware is Linux. So we're doing kernel modifications, user space modifications for that new hardware project. Uh, we also support uh, Debian Linux in, uh, in our cloud offering. Mm-hmm. So our public and private cloud, the HP Helion environment, uses Debian natively. Um, and we use Linux for our, all of our other... Uh, in, uh, all of our other hardware, uh, server hardware runs Linux as well. Okay. How about people, how about customers that, that purchase your machines and, and want to go install Linux on them? Is that, you think that's going to be a smooth experience for them? Is that something that HP supports? Yes, we've supported uh, Linux on our hardware for the last 15 or 20 years, okay. um, and we've always tried to make it as seamless and, trans, uh, and, and easy process as possible. We uh, provide Linux drivers. Uh, we work with the upstream projects to make sure that the uh, Linux kernel and the Linux user space stuff works well on our hardware out of the box. Outstanding. Tell me a little bit about some projects that HP is either working on or projects that HP uses or project, projects that HP supports. Um, so obviously we work in Linux kernel because we have hardware that needs to run yeah. on it. Um, and then we also have a large in, uh, investment in the OpenStack ecosystem okay. uh, with uh, a huge number of uh, contributors to major OpenStack pieces in the HP cloud environment. Um, and then we also work on other networking, uh, NFV stuff, telco stuff, the whole gamut of uh, enterprise computing. HP aside, what's your personal favorite distro? I run Debian. Oh, okay. And uh, how long have you run Debian? I've run Debian for almost 20 years. Okay. And is that something that uh, you find that it may, it, can you get your, your, your work work done on Debian? My business laptop runs Debian exclusively. Really? Uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. And HP is pretty supportive of you doing that. Uh, oddly, yes. Uh, D- Debian is a very important operating system uh, to HP. And so uh, they're very supportive of me running Debian as my, my daily work environment. That's outstanding. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you very much as well. Oh, that was cool. That was uh, that was pretty neat. So he, I, that, that last line there, Debian is very important to HP. Yeah. It w- and I, I'm actually, you know, listening back, um, I wish... I wish it was cult- I wish it was culturally appropriate to set a camera up and then film all of the surrounding stuff because it leaves off <clears throat> it leaves off some of the picture if you don't get the surrounding thing of like all the people that were standing there that were running Linux on their work computers mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. you know and uh I don't know. I just I, want to I, lurk just, there yeah, and watch show them. Yeah, it, just doesn't, it doesn't quite paint the picture as well as it did in person, but yeah. I guess you have to take my word for yeah. it. No, no, that's that's neat. Uh, I, I I like to hear the passion there about in that too. Uh, I thought that was pretty. Cool. You know, one of the things that was pointed out to me, and I haven't seen it anywhere yet on any of the on any of the brochures, but somebody mentioned to me in the hallway that uh, LinuxCon is also offering childcare. Oh no way! Yeah, isn't that cool? Oh, that's awesome. And you know, when it's kind of an expensive conference, that's really a nice perk. It is, especially because I know firsthand uh, couples that both work in yeah. the open source community yep. and have kids, yeah. and that is an issue for them. Yeah, so yeah, that's really nice. And they uh, for for a lot of folks, not all folks, but for a lot of folks, they've provided lunch. You know, they treat the media exceptionally well. Here. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, so that actually, a shout out to Dan Brown has been. Outstanding. I mean, yeah. every little thing yeah. I have, I just my 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 email to Dan is is like my lifeline to for our lifeline really to get things done here. Uh, you know, when we need permission for something, or when we needed, uh, you know, we needed them to make a couple exceptions for us on a couple of rules. I, yeah. Just everything is, yeah. or even when it was just amazing. you know a sandwich. You know, Andrew's able to grab me a sandwich that they're giving out to the yeah. media folks, and they provide a media re- lounge, which isn't too uncommon, but still really nice. Yeah, yeah. I thought I think that uh, I think that everyone at LinuxCon has has done exceptionally well, and you can actually tell it's a really poly 
polished conference. If you look at the way um, that they have the the uh, the keynote hall set up, right? Yeah. They take yeah. the time to put all of the the par uh, all, the all labels. of their DMX, by the way. So I have a lot of sympathy for the poor poor guy who had to set all those up and channel them. Um, but uh, you know they they put the little extra pizzazz to make it re- you you really do get your money's worth uh, yeah. coming out here. There's and they got no display screens up everywhere. I mean, it feels like a high value production. Yeah, it really uh, does. Yeah, yeah, they do a really good job. The uh, there is that with that there is the uh, highly sponsored angle. Yes. So yeah, the that's true. the companies that sponsor um, they get placed in an area called uh, let's see where is it right here. It has a name that's essentially like the sponsor ballroom or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you, uh, yeah, here we go. Let's see. Sponsor ballroom, which is harder to find than yeah, the, uh, yeah. everyone else. Yeah, so essentially if you're a sponsor, you get like really fancy placement, um, which I guess that's fair. I don't like. It Because it, it, the difference is stark. It's like the sponsors go in a, a brightly lit room yeah. that's, that's that looks ni- the nicest room, and then everybody that's an exhibitor that wasn't a sponsor is like out in the hallways and kind of in the peripheral. As, as, a, as a business owner, I have no problem with them uh, treating the, the, the people who make it financially possible to do a conference like this, treating them, uh, giving them a little extra treatment. That's perfectly fine. What I object to is the fact that it is so much more difficult to find that room uh, than than what we originally thought was the expo hall. If you're going to have a an overflow of the expo hall, have it somewhere else where it's not it, the it, first it, thing you ha- walk into. Right, exactly, and have it maybe in a room that that is maybe a little bit more difficult to get to than the people that are paying the money to be there. I, I mean, and that's it, that's a personal preference. I'm sure the I'm sure that the, the 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 fine people at the at the Linux Foundation had a very good reason for organizing it that way, and they spent a lot more time planning this stuff and thinking about it than we do. For, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it uh, is but nice. It like they have uh, they have like a giant hacking lounge, which is kind of cool, and they have a birds of feather sign up lounge. So they, they, that sponsor area is is done really well, and Microsoft has a decent booth there. So does IBM and HP, and uh, I'd say one of the nicest booths here uh, too is the the SUSE booth. I really like the SUSE booth because they have green apples out, they have like green snacks and stuff. So that was really neat. And the Red Hat guys are handing out red hats for, for certain folks. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And what do you think of the Ubuntu booth? I think you stopped by yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't did. You? I got a chance to talk to him, but don't spoil it. That's coming on. Sunday. Oh, that'll be in last too. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that'll be on Friday's last. Man, we got a big Linux action show mm-hmm. coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the last chance as we wrap up here, uh, chat room or mumble room. If you guys have any questions from LinuxCon, um, yeah. Hey, Ange. Ange. Why don't you come over here and uh, give the people a, a quick uh, five second uh, your impressions of uh, of LinuxCon? What did you think of uh, the, since you've been here today? What do you think of it so far? It's pretty cool. I love seeing uh, JB shirts. I've seen a couple. I've seen a couple of people that we saw at Linux Fest Northwest, and I'm already angling for a booth at another con um, or fest or whatever. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely. Like I say, a lot of suits, but there aren't a lot of suits. But it kind of it feels Business-y. that way. It's very businessy. Yeah. 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 All right, Mr. WW, you had a uh, you had a question about the con in the uh, mobile room. Go ahead, sir. So have have you come to a conclusion yet? What the cons or pros are of going to Linux con versus going to like a fast where it's more casual or? Well, it kind of goes back to our it kind of goes back to our answer. It's like if you wanna if you wanna kind of rub elbows with. Uh, more community aspect. People that are more writing the code and thinking about the code and thinking about community and standards and, and collaboration. Then you kind of want to go to a fest. If you want to meet the people that are gonna, that are, that are creating solutions and selling the code and that maybe you're going to solve a problem you have at work, then you might want to go to a con. Not that fest doesn't have yeah. that stuff too. I would I would just I would just ask what what are you what are you going to get out of it? Do you want to do you want to talk about your passion for Linux or do you want to sell Linux? Um, and that. That's a little black and white, but that's kind of what it comes down to. It is, but that, I mean, that's just, I, I, if you have to make the if you have to make a decision about a flight and a hotel yeah. and the tickets, then you need to know that. Yeah, I, I guess that I, I guess I say that because that's the metric that I've used. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, I would never yeah. go to a. I mean, being honest here, I would never go to a fest and expect to come back with profitable material for my business. I would never go to a. I would never go to uh, I would never go to a con without expecting to be able mm-hmm. to make a profit on it, mm-hmm. and and transversely, I would never go to to a fest and not expect to build some yeah. relationship. But I would be perfectly okay with going to uh, a con and coming back yeah. with nothing more than than a business sense, even if we didn't have you know uh, you know a community bonding. I mean, there is no going out to the range and shooting here. There is no uh, going out for burgers and stuff uh, unless you you know unless you range it privately, <laughs> as opposed to what do you think of no, what do you think of North Ranger? He says maybe it's a mullet. 
It's yeah. a uh, it's a mode of gatherings. Business in the front, party in the back. That's yeah. not bad. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Okay, that's a good. We that's can, a good we can go right that. there. Uh, all right. So uh, Linux Unplugged is live on Tuesdays over at jblive.tv. We do the show at two p.m. Pacific. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com/slash/calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. We'd love to have you join us live in our virtual lug in our mumble room. Do bang mumble in our IRC chat room, and you can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com/slash/contact to send us an email. Or if you'd like to get content or discussions or any kind of like feedback or topic generation like that linuxactionshow.reddit.com no is there anywhere you'd like to send people throughout the week yeah i'd send them uh, to ultraspeed ultraspeed.com and uh i we are continuing to work on expanding the ability to do remote support we actually just we just finalized uh the final uh, in production test of doing cloud-based wi-fi so we now have the Ooh. ability yeah we now actually have the ability and this i haven't actually put the, this hasn't actually gone out to the website and we haven't sent flyers and product literature and stuff but we actually now have the ability if you have a property uh, and you want Wi-Fi in that property we can actually ship you an entire box of stuff Dang, and dude. you plug the cables in and we take it from there wow. and we manage the whole thing remotely yeah, Altaspeed.com yeah, we, yeah Altaspeed.com we rolled that out at a hotel in Mankato, Minnesota there was actually a guy on Twitter that was asking where he could stay where we would manage the Wi-Fi it's a quality in a Mankato uh, that's our first place that we've rolled that system out and so far it's been 100% so cool everybody well thank you so much for doing this week's episode of Linux Unplugged and we'll see you right back here next week Hey, no, I have a question for you. All right, I have an answer for you. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if your question and my answer match up? Could we have done this whole transmission over SIP back to the... Uh, yes, yes, we could have. So why didn't we just use SIP? Because I don't... I have never tried a SIP call that long to know if, if A, the quality would be sufficient, although I suspect it would. But my big concern is I don't know if the... If SIP is very, very finicky if you actually lose internet. Oh. Um, and then I... Ha- because it has to re-register with the server, and then we'd have to reinitiate the call. Uh, and I, that is, that I would be, we'd have to try a test call for an hour before I would really feel comfortable saying try it. Although I suppose, technically it's no worse than Skype. Skype has to, you have to hey, register. No. With, hey, what's up? I do uh, SIP calls to conference calls all the time for very long periods, like okay. two, three hours at a time. And for me, on my home Wi-Fi, it never drops off. Just really? Just a Well, obviously, hmm. you're, you're on conference Wi-Fi. It might be a bit tricky. Yeah, but we're not yeah, actually. We've provided our own, and it's, it, we, our internet's actually pretty strong, so I'll have to give that a shot. Now, Poopy, did you modify the codecs at all, or are you just using the default ones, whatever comes set with the the SIP client? I was just using the default that was on uh, Android. I'm connecting oh. to a um, an asterisk server in the office. Oh, my gosh. You're doing it over Android? So we could, yeah, so we fine. just, br- we just bring a little interface. Yeah. And <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, dude. Uh, How cool would that be? All this can go away. We just plug yeah. it. <laughs> you gotta work. What could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? Run the whole show on Android. Android. I don't think anything could go wrong. Nah, it'll be fine. That'll be fine. This should, it should be nice. Actually, and the, the app has a local recording as well. So it can just record the whole conversation. I use it when we're having internal calls. Oh, I record good. them and then make them available for other people. Well, that's a good idea. All right, so we got to pick our title. we got to go to jbtitles.com and pick this thing. Hey, I suggested a title. You did? Yeah, for was once it? in my life. How was it? I don't know. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Do you want to vote? jbtitles.com, yeah, sure. jbtitles.com. Sure. Why certainly? Banksuggest.com. Sure. Why not? Sure. Oh, I went to jblive.tv. Oh, how come I have no uh, jbtitles.com? I don't know. Why don't you? Oh, I don't either. Oh, here it goes. Now oh, it's going. Oh, oh there it goes. I Connecting the docs. That's kind of funny. Oh, yeah. Well, Connecting the docs. Pretty, that pretty. actually, is, that, that kind of works. That kind of works. Containing LinuxCon 2015. That's not bad. LinuxCon 2015 mullet party. That's not bad either. There goes Greg KH. All right. I have voted for Colonel Maintainer side. Extraordinaire. Absolution of attribution. With the celebrities. Look at us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hobnobbing. That must, be a, that, must be, that must be a... That must be a... That must be a... I've heard of hobnobbing before. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, all right. Oh, I'm trying did, to educate did, man. Has Poppy told you about his new snack that he really <laughs> likes? Ha- haggis? <laughs> what? Haggis? What's haggis? Am I pronouncing that right? It's delicious. Yes. Uh, tell him what it is, though. Uh, it's awful. 
uh, <laughs> mixed with oats and spices. <laughs> it's awful. So it's like a it's like a breakfast. A boiled. Uh, yeah, stomach. you often have a slice of it, slice of it fried uh, with fried. breakfast. If you have a, like a full English breakfast, you'd have like sausage, bacon, eggs, beans, and all that, and black pudding. Uh, oh, I'm thinking of black pudding, but black pudding and uh, yeah, haggis very similar. But no, you'd normally have haggis with. Um, Potatoes and uh, vegetables. It's lovely. It's like stomach and kidneys and stuff. What right? do you fry it in? Like, it's what kind delicious. of gre- grease or oil? Is it no, no, or? sorry, I was confusing. Oh, uh, oh that was black pudding you fry. Haggis. Gotcha. But haggis is, comes in like a bag. It used to be like sheep's stomach. A but bag. Oh. Oh. Sheep's stomach, yeah. And you boil it. Yeah. Yeah. Come boil on. sheep's stomach. Come on. Let's not. See? It's delicious. Delicious, delicious, see? Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife won't eat it. She won't go anywhere near it. Uh, so What's it smell I, like? I, I, when she goes out, it smells delicious. It smells like a bag of offal <laughs> boiled. <laughs> what else is it going to smell you, like? You married up, my friend. <laughs> Do you put any sauce on it, or you just eat it as is? I, I Actually, I had it the other night with some uh, sriracha on it, which was Ooh. even better. Because sriracha makes everything it, Sriracha does. You know, what, you know what Rick, I put sriracha on? Hmm. Pizza. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Totally yeah. ordered pizza Ooh, with sriracha. Yeah. It was yeah. really good, yeah, actually. Yeah. No, I've seen that. That's a thing. That's good. Uh, JBTales.com. Barbecue a haggis. Oh, stop it. Damn if it. you dig a pit. Ooh. If you dig a pit. If you dig a pit. Yeah. Connecting the docks, containing LinuxCon 2015 are my favorite. My the there is a vegetarian is haggis, by Connecting the docks is good, but containing LinuxCon suggests LinuxCon. I think actually connecting the docks is good. Yeah. But if you're going to have containing, it should be not, can't contain LinuxCon. Containing LinuxCon 2015. Can't contain. You can't contain Linux. I don't know man. if you get it. You don't get it. I think well, connecting I do the docks is I better. Yeah, no, oh, if you yeah, don't, don't watch like the it. episode, oh, you don't get yeah, yeah. it. So I think I oh, like I connecting the docks better. All right. North Ranger, you win, sir. You win. What was yours, Colonel Linux? Can't contain Linux? Yeah, ah, yeah. I see. See? Get it? Get yeah, it. I do can't get it. Contain. Now I see why you were enthusiastic about that. So, Mumblem, were you able to hear the clips okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. It's a little hokey. Hey. But every time we get it, we learn. So thanks for making it, you guys. I love your faces. Welcome. We actually didn't even remember hey. you guys until this morning. That's not we- true at all. Chris remembered you. Oh, well, Noah didn't. And so since I was the one that was planning equipment, I was still <laughs> figuring out how I was going to do that's it this true. morning. That's, that, is, that, that part is kind of true. Uh, all right, you guys. Well, what? We're yeah. going to expect some flowers, and then we'll be fine. Okay. All right. I can do yeah, that. Flowers yeah, and fl- haggis. What about chocolates? And haggis. Oh, and haggis. Yeah. yeah. Popey can supply the haggis. All right. Question on uh, Bruce's talk. Um, well, do you think? Do you have a? Will they have a full link to that? Somewhere? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they will. They yeah. will publish it. They send it off to their media guys, and then they send it out to Mount Kilimanjaro, where monkeys chew on it for a while, and then spit it back out. And then a hiker brings it back down from Mount Kilimanjaro, and they publish it. And that takes a couple weeks. I believe that's how it works. It's a big. It's a big mountain. You know.